look forward to that day when we stand before your throne and sing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Lord, that, that song of heaven where we get to rejoice together before your throne. And until then, Lord, we value this time as we can stand in your presence here at church with your people and give you glory and honor. Lord, a bunch of flawed people that are messed up and full of mistakes and even failures. And Lord, to be able to stand in your presence based on your grace and your goodness, your kindness. Lord, not unto us, like the psalmist said, unto thy name be glory and honor. Lord, we, we applaud you today and pray that that our hearts would be worshipful, not just in song, but also as we study the scriptures. Lord, your word is that lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Lord, your word illuminates and give us, gives us understanding of things going on around us and what we're to do, how we're to think. So Lord, may your word do its work in our lives today, we pray. So we invite you into this time, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And why don't you go ahead and have a seat, make yourself comfy. Welcome, and, and we're glad you're here, uh, worshiping the Lord with us on this uh, sunny Sunday afternoon. Um, hey, a couple things uh, as it is, thank you, as it is Memorial Day weekend, uh, uh, it's a, always a fun time. I've noticed that a lot of times when people camp on this weekend, it's rainy. So you guys, it was raining this morning, so you guys chose wisely. A roof over your head, church, worshiping the Lord here, that's great. Um, and one of the things we're thankful for, of course, those who have given their lives in service on a Memorial Day weekend, but also I like to uh, remember and thank the, the Lord for all of our veterans and those serving. We have a bunch of AC Creekers serving overseas even right now. So, uh, uh, man, God bless them and praying for them as well and thankful for the sacrifice of our, of our servicemen and, and women. So uh, that's something we like to be thankful for. Also, um, a few other announcements you should know about. Uh, don't forget Wednesday night through the Bible right here. Uh, and if you can't join us live, you can join us live online and just sit in the comfort of your home and take in a Wednesday night Bible study. So we'd love to have you join us. And that's our through the Bible, verse by verse. We don't skip a word right on through the Bible. Um, and so that's happening Wednesday. Tonight we have uh, worship. The church uh, gathers on s Sunday nights, every other Sunday night for uh, just a worship service. Sunday night worship. And there's communion, prayer, and uh, just rejoicing in the Lord from 6 o'clock till 7. It's an hour-long service where you can come and just worship the Lord, kick your week off right. Um, and that's great. That'll be tonight. One other thing, don't forget, this is exciting. Our, our staff and volunteers and the leadership crew have been working very carefully and hard the last several months getting ready for uh, next Sunday is the first Sunday in Salem where we're going to be live streaming and, um, and, a, and having a, a church service right down there in Salem. So uh, it's going to be exciting. Yes, praise the Lord for that. How many of you guys are going to go to that uh, this next Sunday? Right on. Are you guys Salem folks? Welcome, we're glad you're here, but tell us how it goes. Uh, that'll be awesome. I'm excited. Um, so that's next Sunday. They're going to be at the Psalm Center at Corbin University. Um, in fact, Joey, uh, he's the one playing guitar up here. He's got, he's got his whole worship band. They're going to be leading worship next Sunday down there, while uh, I think Kyle is going to have another worship team up here. So there's live worship, but uh, we're going to pipe the live teaching from here, the 10 o'clock service to Salem. So we're excited about what the Lord will do with that. Um, why are we doing that? Um, because we feel like um, the Lord has more, more discipleship, more people getting into the word, being saved, uh, being baptized. Uh, to, to me, it's, it's, um, it's great to see how the Lord can use just this steady teaching of God's word. So that's what we're doing, reaching into Salem, hopefully be a blessing. Tell your Salem friends, spread the word next Sunday, 10 o'clock at Corbin University. Don't worry about, the campus is a little confusing, but if you're driving there, um, just go in, they'll direct you, they'll show a point in the right direction where to go, and it's going to be awesome, so next Sunday. Well, let's get to it, Psalm chapter 122, would you turn there as we continue through the Bible, Psalm 122. As we go verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book, I take a small verse from our upcoming study, so that's what we're doing today, one single verse that will be our springboard to really discuss what this verse means and why it's even there. And uh, let's, let's explore this. It says here in Psalm 122, verse 6, Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They shall prosper that love thee. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They shall prosper that love thee. 
what's the big deal about Jerusalem? Who cares or, or who should care? Uh, there's other cities in the world that are far more interesting technically. There's other cities in the world that have more, you know, that, that strategically or, or uh, even, you know, the natural resources. I mean, the absurdity of Jerusalem being globally significant, it really is laughable. I've been to Jerusalem many times. I spent months in Jerusalem. And it is an amazing city, but not for any of the normal reasons that the city is amazing. And when you get to Jerusalem, you can sense that there's something special about it, but you can't put your finger on it. There's no way to really say, well, this is why Everybody's so up in arms about Jerusalem. Why is it that Jerusalem's on the news every day? Why is it that the world has strong opinions, mostly against the Jews, mostly against Israel and, and the Jews, and definitely Jerusalem? Man, that's a hotbed of controversy. Who cares? There's so many other cities we could talk about. We could talk about Paris. I've been to Paris a few times. Um, it was always in transition. I usually had like a 10 or 15 hour layover or something in Paris. And my, not, my wife was never with me. So here I'm in the most romantic city of the world, uh, going up the Eiffel Tower, yay. <laughs> I'd call her, honey, I'm in the Eiffel Tower. It's really romantic. I uh, wish you were here. But uh, yeah, Paris is a beautiful city, but it's on fire. Have you seen that? Like the consternation in Paris and the uh, unrest, and there's people burning big bonfires in the center streets of Paris, and there's there's anti-Semitism. I mean, they're burning synagogues, and, and there's all kinds of crazy stuff going on in Paris right now. Um, Germany. Germany. Man, there's, you know, Berlin is a problem right now. Why, why are people talking about Berlin? Um, even yesterday in Berlin, there was an um, interesting warning by the um, government commissioner of um, of anti-Semitism in Germany. He warned Jews in an AFP article just yesterday. This is just yesterday, Saturday. Um, they warned that the Jews should stop wearing yarmulkes publicly all over the country. Yarmulkes, of course, uh, the men wear those little skull cap, uh, little tiny hats. And, and if, if, if they're saying, don't wear those. Why? Because anti-Semitism in Germany is at a feverish level. In fact, experts say it's worse than before World War II when Hitler was wanting to exterminate the Jewish people. Here's what the government commissioner said. I cannot advise Jews to wear the yarmulke everywhere, anytime, in Germany, Felix Klein said in an interview. Um, his comments came just weeks after Berlin's top legal expert on anti-Semitism said, the issue remains entrenched in German society. Anti-Semitism, quote, has always been here, he said, but I think that recently it has again become louder, more aggressive, and flagrant. Claudia Vanoni told AFP in an interview and said that the problem was deeply rooted in German society. Um, Anti-Semitic cries or crimes or anti-Semitism, hatred for the Jews, um, it rose 20% in Berlin uh, in, in this last year. Um, and they blame it on the extreme right. Uh, I guess the extreme right in Germany it's funny when they ascribe it to the right or the left. It's, it's always interesting. Benoni said the proliferation of online platforms that allow people to express extremist views without inhibition while hiding behind computer screens has fostered the rise in anti-Semitism. Um, and it goes on and says that one of the problems is the Germans are tired of having to apologize uh, and pay atonement for their World War II atrocities. And so they're saying it's contributing to the change in the atmosphere um, that uh, also along with million, one million asylum seekers, many from countries like Syria, Afghanistan, and Iraq, has contributed to a furthering of anti-Semitism. And so Jews are fleeing Germany once again. It's a dangerous thing to be a Jew in Germany once again. And where does a Jew go? Well, that's interesting because since the 1700s, Theodore Herschel and the Zionist movement, they were all saying, there's no safe place for a Jew in the world. People hate the Jews. So they said, we need our homeland. So they started migrating back to Jerusalem, back to Israel. And that's why by May 14th, 1948, they were once again declared a nation. But ever since then, they've had nothing but trouble. The day after they became a nation, they were attacked by five Arab nations. 
um, and, and really a biblically proportioned, miraculous battle fought there where God really protected the Jews. They had pickup trucks and pitchforks when, when they were in the, the War of Independence in, in May of 1948. Five modern uh, you know, uh, military nations could not wipe out the Jews in 1948. That was a miraculous deal. What's the big deal? Why, why, not let the Arab, why don't the Arabs just say, hey, take Jerusalem, take Israel? At the time, it was just kind of a dump. It was a desert. It had been just kind of nothing growing. It was, it was just really kind of the armpit of that region. Just read Mark Twain's writings from 150 years ago. But what have the Jews done? They moved in there, took it upon themselves to garden and, and figure out scientific ways of drip irrigation systems, and they brought the land back to life. And only in the last several decades, as the world set its sights on Jerusalem as, well, it doesn't belong to the Jews. Well, Brett, the Muslims, they, they say Jerusalem is the third most holy site in all of Islam. But I always like to remind people, that's a new thing. Do you know that? That's a new thing. When did the city of Jerusalem and the Temple Mount become the third most holy site of Islam? In the 1920s. It was the Grand Mufti, who was the, um, I believe he was the uncle of, remember Yasser Arafat? It was his great uncle, actually, who declared the Temple Mount the third most holy site in Islam. And that's when it became that. Before that, most Muslims could care less about Jerusalem. So why is Jerusalem at the epicenter of all the news and all the controversy? And why is the world up in arms about Jerusalem? You know, even though there's nothing there that's really redemptive, there's no reason. It's not even the most beautiful city. Um, what's the deal with that? People try to claim it as their own. Uh, there was a San Francisco Chronicle article a few years back, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. The Pope in the Vatican was trying to claim Jerusalem for all monotheistic religions. So who should we believe? The San Francisco Chronicle? Or sh should we look somewhere else to find why is Jerusalem such a hotbed of controversy? Why do the Muslims say it's our city? The Palestinians claim it to be their city. The Jews are saying we have the right to exist and be here. Um, the United States, we've taken traditionally in the last 20 years kind of a sort of a hostile uh, attitude saying the Jews need to give up at least half. Our previous president said we need to divide Jerusalem in half. He said the, the, the borders need to go back to 1967 borders. That's what President Obama said. Keep that in mind because the 67 borders would chop Jerusalem in half. And that's important because of what Bible prophecy says. I'll tell you about that in a, in a little bit. But why does everybody care? There's nothing about Jerusalem that should be any reason why anybody cares. Well, Brett, it's the Arab-Israeli conflict. That's why it's the center of attention. It's the Palestinians and the oppression of the Jews upon the Palestinians. That's why everybody's upset. And even if I gave that to you, what's interesting about that is there are hundreds of cities and nations that have far worse uh, situations that are active right now. There's places in Africa that are horrifying ethnic cleansing going on right now. Uh, that's not happening in Jerusalem. Um, I have Palestinian friends that live in Jerusalem, and I've talked to them, and they've said, we just want to live in Israel. We're happy. Um, and, and largely, the Palestinians have become sort of a pawn of the other Arab nations that surround Israel, that want Israel gone. A lot of the Palestinians that live in Israel just want to live peacefully. The Palestinians down in, in the Gaza Strip that are down there controlled by Hamas, that's a whole other story. I told you a few weeks ago, there were, I told you on a service like this, there were 600 rockets launched from Gaza into Israel. Um, correction, by the time Sunday was over, it was 800 rockets. 800 rockets being launched over the border by the uh, Palestinian and the Hamas, supported fully by the Iranians. And that's where all the money comes from. That's where the rockets come from. It's the Iranians. It's a proxy war. The Iranians, they're very interested in wiping out Jerusalem and the Jews. Why? What's the deal? 
Well, you have to look to the Bible to realize it's not the Arab-Israeli conflict that makes Jerusalem so important. It might seem that way. It's not natural resources or the beauty of the city or I don't even believe it's the hatred and anti-Semitism against the Jews. There's one reason why everybody's got their eyes on Jerusalem and whether they know it or not, the Bible tells us the reason. And let me read it to you. You can jot down a few of these scriptures. Second Chronicles chapter six, verse five and six. Listen to this. God says, since the day that I brought forth my people out of the land of Egypt, I chose no city among all the tribes of Israel to build a house in, that my name might be there. Neither chose I any man to be ruler over my people Israel. But, here's the Lord speaking, I have chosen Jerusalem that my name might be there and have chosen David to be over my people Israel. Now, what does that mean? God's saying, my name's on Jerusalem. He didn't put his name on New York City or Los Angeles or Dundee or Newburgh. He didn't put his name on those cities. He put his name on Jerusalem. That's, that's an interesting thing. Well, how long did he do that? Well, jot this one down, 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 33. Listen to this. Uh, pardon me, chapter 33, verse 7. It says this. No, 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 let me back up. 2 Chronicles 7, 16. And I'll get to that next one in a second. 2 Chronicles 7, 16. For now I have chosen and sanctified this house, the temple built in Jerusalem, that my name may be there forever. How long is his name going to be there? Forever. That's a long time. And he says that my eyes and my heart shall be there perpetually. What does God say about Jerusalem? Jerusalem's mine. I put my name on it. My eyes are on it perpetually and my heart is there. Man, you know, who was it that left their heart in San Francisco? I don't remember. Was it Sinatra? God left his heart in Jerusalem, and that's more important than what Sinatra's thinking about. God's heart is in Jerusalem, and he names Jerusalem. He says, that's mine. Jerusalem is mine. My heart and my eyes are perpetually, that means eternally, on Jerusalem. You see, the reason the world is all up in arms about Jerusalem, you can name whatever problem or trouble that's going there, but the reason Jerusalem's important is because God says, that's my city. And he also says that the Jews are my people. And he allows the Jews to live in his city. In fact, God gave that city to the Jews. Interestingly enough, but it's still his city. He lets them live there. They're, they're sort of renting it from the Lord, the Jews. If anybody has a right to be in Jerusalem, according to the Bible, it's the Jews. Now, now 2 Chronicles 33, 7, where it says, in this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen before all the tribes of Israel, I will put my name forever. You see, over and over in the Bible, God says, Jerusalem is where my name is. My heart is there. My eyes are upon it perpetually. So forget the San Francisco Chronicle. It's not the Muslims. It's not the Christians. It's not the Jews even. It's God's city, and God claims it as his own. This is why the world, I think, cent centers its attention and that's why CNN, Fox News, MSNBC, and all the news people talk about Jerusalem continually. Why is Jerusalem such a big deal? Because it's God's city. And it has a lot to do with what God is going to do with Jerusalem in the future. You see, everything we're seeing happening in the Middle East and around the world right now has very much to do with the epicenter, Jerusalem. This is important for you to understand this. Otherwise, You'll scratch your head and try to figure out the geopolitics, and it won't make a lot of sense unless you realize what's going on. So let's, let's start at a high level, and we'll kind of zero in on what, what's going to happen. So the first question I asked is, what's the big deal about Jerusalem? Why is Jerusalem not a peaceful city? It's, it's funny to me that Jerusalem's called the, by name. Yerushalom is the city of peace. It's been everything but that historically, but it's going to be going to be the most peaceful city of all someday. What do you mean, Brett? Well, let's back up. What's going to happen? Well, the Bible tells us, first of all, the thing you need to know about Jerusalem, nations are going to be blessed because of Jerusalem, but nations are going to be cursed because of Jerusalem. It's like our text where it says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem, for it says, they shall prosper that love thee. Anybody who loves Jerusalem is going to prosper. But any, any nation that hates Jerusalem, they're going to be cursed. 
Abraham, the father of the Jews, was told in Genesis chapter 12, man, I will bless the nations that bless Israel and I will curse the nations that curse Israel. And what's amazing is you can track that historically. Any nation or people group that have loved Jerusalem or loved Israel, the Lord blesses them. Any nation that hates the Jews and hates Israel, they find themselves always sort of cursed. What do you mean, Brett? Well, now I'm going to get really controversial because what I found is it's really funny. About 50-50 in our congregation, half the people in this congregation hate Donald Trump. The other half of this congregation love Donald Trump. Okay, there might be a third group, people who could care less about any of it. Um, There's some of you as well. I understand that. But but I'm amazed that it's it's right down, kind of split down the middle as far as lovers and haters and But that's not the point that I want to make, whether you love Donald Trump or hate him or whatever. We've done sermons on what we're supposed to, we're supposed to pray for our president, whoever he is or whoever she might be someday. We're we're supposed to pray. And that's what we do here at Athey. We pray for our president. We don't condone or say they're all awesome. We just pray. But here's the thing. Let's talk about what this president has done. And where are we at as a nation? That right now, all the pundits argue, why are we so prosperous right now? Our economy is more prosperous than any time in my lifetime, and I'm only 25. (laughs) Okay, maybe it's a little longer than that. I'm just kidding. But truly, it's amazing. I've not seen prosperity like this. I mean, our economy's booming. The stock market's booming. Unemployment is at an all-time low. Um, Housing for minority groups is on an all-time high. Like, there's so much monetary prosperity. Now, now there's some people that are trying to make the case, well, it's because of what Obama did, and we're just now appreciating what happened there. Um, don't think that's true. Um, but some people say, it's because of Trump. He's a genius um, financially. I don't think that's true. We can argue about that. Why are we being blessed? I think there's one reason. And it goes back to what we talked about a a little over a year ago when Donald Trump said, we as the United States of America recognize Jerusalem as the capital city of Israel. When our president did that, the Jews were dancing in the streets celebrating. And they were having a great time. And and they, they were celebrating because once the United States finally, after 70 years, the Jews said, Jerusalem's our capital. They've been saying that for 70 years, but the whole world said, no, it's not. But when we did that, what's kind of amazing, as soon as we as a nation did that, man, we've been getting our socks blessed off. Not only that, a few months ago even, Donald Trump did something else that was kind of a shocker. He declared the Golan Heights to be technically Israel's, that that's the land of Israel. Golan Heights? Well, see, the problem is the world says, no, the Jews are occupiers. They're occupying the Golan Heights. Um, By the way, if you're into studying the history of the world and what's really gone on and the Balfour Declaration and the the British Mandate and that whole thing that happened with Israel and World War I, World War II, if you really know the history of it, it's kind of a laughable thing when the world says Jews are occupying the Golan Heights. Trump was just acknowledging what is true. No, that belongs to the Jews. And the Jews again, they're celebrating. They name a train in Jerusalem after Trump. There's a Trump train that, that, that drives through Jerusalem. There's actually streets now called Trump Street in Jerusalem. There's a city in the Golan Heights that they named after Trump. There's a Trump town in, in, in the Golan Heights now. Brother, we don't like Donald Trump. That's horrible that they're celebrating. Why are the Jews happy? Because we blessed them as a nation. Our president, whether you like him or hate him, it doesn't matter. He made the Jews in Jerusalem very, very happy, happier than any president in the history of the United States. That's just what happened. Love him or hate him. And all the while, we're just being blessed as a nation, economically particularly, while we're in so many other ways in a disaster. You know, our nation's divided and there's hatred and all kinds of craziness. But in the middle of all that, We're just being blessed economically out of our minds. What's going on there? I think the Bible. I will bless the nations that bless Israel. I will curse the nations that curse Israel. So meanwhile, what about nations that curse Israel? The number one nation that curses Israel right now is Iran. It's not even a question. The former president of Iran, the one previous to the ones now, uh, Ahmadinejad, was the most vocal of all. We're going to blow Israel off the map. 
We're going to drive the Jews into the sea. Israel is ours. And the rhetoric was ramped up to a feverish level with Ahmadinejad. And, and, and the Iranians, they would love nothing more than to drive the Jews off the map. That's, that's their goal. They're not even trying to hide that. It's, it's what they say all the time. If you ever want to see it for your own eyes, there's a website called Memory. Uh, it stands for something, M-E-M-R-I. And it's basically you can watch um, Muslim news from the Middle East and they'll translate for you. You'd be shocked what they talk about on there. But one of the things they're always talking about is the, the evil Jews, the Saturday people, and we're going to death to America, death to Israel. Like, that's what they're all talking about. Why? Because they hate Jerusalem. And as long as America is looking over the shoulder of, of Israel, Iran has to deal with us. You say, Brett, what does that have to do with me? Do you understand that as we speak, we're sending our soldiers toward Iran right now? This is the news this weekend. We're sending a carrier group over right now to the, the Strait of Hormuz. Um, Trump just said yesterday, we're sending more troops to that region of the world. Why? Because the Iranians and the United States, there's an escalation going on right now that's pretty serious. And it has everything to do with what we're talking about. Jerusalem. Oh, Brad, I think it has to do with oil. Well, indirectly. You see, what the United States is going to do is sanction Iran because we, we don't believe they're going to keep any treaties and they're not, and they're working feverishly to get a nuclear weapon. And we're saying Iran, and the Jews are saying, there's no way we're going to let Iran go nuclear. Why, Brett? There's other nations that have gone nuclear. We should let it be balanced. Let the Iranians balance out the Jews. Um, man, the, the ignorance is big on this one. And there's a lot of college professors that teach this nonsense to a bunch of college students. Balance? There's a reason, by the way, why even the most liberal of countries in Europe are saying, no, the Iranians should not have a nuclear weapon. Here's why. In 1979, there was the Islamic Revolution. Some of you are old enough to remember the Ayatollah Khomeini and the, the hostage crisis and the bombings in Beirut. Iran never paid for any of that stuff that they did to us as Americans, along with all the other people that they've killed between then and now. Um, the Iranians, well, but they're not in a war. They're not technically in a war, but all these proxy wars by the Iranians are going on as we speak. The Hamas and those 800 rockets I told you about, all were Iranian funded. They're trying to shoot over into Israel through the Hamas, the Palestinians in the south. Up in Syria, did you hear last week the Jews were bombing again in Damascus? Why? Because the Iranians are setting up shop in Damascus on the northern border of the Golan Heights in Israel. And the Jews are like, we're not going to let the Iranians do that. Why, Brett? That's not very nice to let them have a camp out in Syria. There should be balance. No, because here's why. The Iranian has a very different worldview in their Shiite Muslim eschatology. What's that, Brett? Now, you got to understand something. I've, I've been reading and hearing about some great things that are happening in Iran with a bunch of Iranians are coming to know Christ, which is amazing because it can cost you your life being a Christian in Iran. But, it, but the, there is a revival happening in Iran right now. So it's not as much about the people as it is about the leadership of Iran, the Shiite Muslim clerics and imams and all that stuff. They believe an eschatology, that is the end time scenario, that is really so radical, it, it actually scares people. In fact, did you know that Benjamin Netanyahu, Prime Minister of Israel, spoke in front of the UN a few years ago, and I, I thought it was amazing that he even brought this up, because nobody ever talks about this, but this is true. He said this to the UN. Uh, Netanyahu addressed the UN saying, Iran's apocalyptic leaders believe that a medieval holy man will reappear in the wake of devastating holy war thereby ensuring that their brand of radical Islam will rule the earth. And that's not just what they believe, that is actually guiding their policies and their actions. Well, then Ahmadinejad, the guy I was talking about earlier, the president of Iran, he got up in front of the UN and said this, God Almighty has promised us a man of kindness, a man who loves people and loves absolute justice, a man who is perfect, he's the perfect human being, his name is... Imam al-Mahdi, a man who will come in the company of Jesus, peace be upon him and, and, and the righteous. Now some of you are like, oh, that's great. The Islamic president loves Jesus. 
That's not what I just read. Basically, he just said, they've got a Messiah that's coming, the Muslim Shiite Al-Mahdi. And Jesus is going to tag along with him, but it's really all about the Mahdi. Jesus is sort of his, you know, underling. And they're going to come and they're going to bring peace into the world. Brett, that's weird. That kind of sounds like what you Christians believe. Oh yeah, we believe Jesus is coming. He's going to rule and reign, but he's going to come and do it single-handedly. He's going to be the ruler. He's going to come with 10,000s of his saints, but it's Jesus. But see, what's interesting, if you're a Bible student, the apocalyptic eschatology of the Muslim looks very much like what the Bible calls the Antichrist and his false prophet. If you study the, the, the end time beliefs of the Shiite Muslim and the 12th Imam, you realize that they believe this world leader is going to come and one of the things he's going to do is finally wipe out those pesky Jews. What does the Bible say the Antichrist is going to do? He's going to make war against Israel and war against the Jews. And he's going to bring all the nations of the world with him. So when Akhvedenijad is saying, yeah, uh, Netanyahu is right. We do believe in the 12th Imam. And he's going to come. But here's where it gets a little crazy. Here's where you should be a little nervous about Iran getting nuclear weapons. Um, I had a college student, first service this morning, come up to me and just shaking mad. Oh, you know, you're, you're just, what was the word? Uh, you know, the, the sermon you gave was just totally wrong and can't believe you shared that. She was just shaking with anger. And, and, and it's because she said, you know, I believe that there should be balance. The Iranians should have nuclear weapons. The Jews have nuclear weapons. That balance. Here's the problem. The Iranians are the ones saying, when we get our nuclear weapon, we're going to blow Israel off the map. We want the Jews to cease to exist. And I, I asked her this question. I said, listen, if, if today the Arabs and Israelis and the conflict over there, if, if all of the Arab nations surrounding Israel dropped their weapons and said, okay, peace, what would the Jews do? Well, anybody that knows the situation there, the Jews would drop their weapons and there would be peace. That's, the Jews want peace. The, the, the military power they've been using is in defense of all the missiles coming across their borders and all that stuff. If you turn it around and if you say, okay, no, 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 the Jews say, we want peace, so we're dropping all our weapons, what's the next thing that would happen? All those Arab nations that since May 14th of 1948 have been wanted to pound on Jerusalem, pound on Israel, they would come in and just wipe it all out. The very second the Jews lay down their weapons. And, and, and here's why. The 12th Imam, the, the, the eschatology of the Shiite Muslim of, of Iran, they believe he's the one who's going to come. But before he can come, now this is where it gets crazy. Before he can come, there has to be global chaos, death and destruction, even not only around the world, but even in Iran itself. They believe that, see, the reason nobody's used nuclear weapons up to this point is mutually assured destruction. It's a, a MAD. It's, it's, we know that, you know, after, you know, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, we were the only ones with the bomb at the time. And man, that ceased the war. Nobody said, okay, no more. But then other nations, the Soviet Union and the United States, and then eventually Israel and China and Pakistan and India and North Korea, for crying out loud, they all got nuclear weapons. What has kept some of the craziest people from using those nuclear weapons? Mutually assured destruction. They know. Kim Jong-un even knows as, as Nutty as he tends to be. Um, he knows that if he blows up South Korea with nuclear weapons, that the world is not going to let that happen, and they're going to be flattened. Mutually assured destruction is a deterrent. And that's what's happened so far. The reason even the most liberal countries say Iran cannot get a nuclear weapon is because they're hoping for mutually assured destruction. Their eschatology preaches mutually. They're hoping that all of the world goes into total chaos so that the 12th Imam will rise and bring everlasting peace. This is the, you don't take my word for it. You can read the writings of the Islamic, you know, clerics and all that about the 12th Imam. It's all right there. And that's why Akhmadinejad and others have said, we're going to blow Israel off the map. That's why we can't afford to let Iran get a nuclear weapon. That's why we're sending carriers. It's not just about oil. It's about Jerusalem. It's about us standing with Jerusalem and Israel. And some people have a real problem with that. Some people are like, well, why are we supporting Israel? Um, it probably has something to do with a spiritual issue. 
It's not just oil. It's not just geopolitics. It's that God says, Jerusalem is mine. And, and what's interesting is the Bible tells us that this is what's going to happen. You know, that, that the world is going to center its wrath and anger toward Israel. Do you want to see how it's going to shake out? Turn with me to Zechariah chapter 12. I'll show you. The prophet Zechariah spells it out in detail. Let's, let's take a look real quick. It's Zechariah chapter 12. If you're looking for Zechariah, it's toward the end of the Old Testament where your pages stick together in your Bible. Zechariah chapter 12. Pretty crazy language the prophet busts out here. It's, it's Zechariah 12.1. The burden of the word of the Lord for Israel, saith the Lord, which stretches forth the heavens and lays the foundation of the earth and forms the spirit of man within him. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling. Now pause there for a second. The word trembling, interesting word. Your margin, many of your Bibles say poison or slumber. Well, bro, which one is it, slumber or poison? It's poison that makes you slumber. <laughs> if you drink it, you're weak, you're weak in the knees, and that's why it's called a, a, a cup of trembling. You, you drink it, you tremble, and you pass out. In other words, bad news. Jerusalem's going to be bad news when it says, unto all people round about when they shall be in siege both against Judah and against Jerusalem. In other words, any nation that tries to take on Jerusalem and Judea, which is basically Israel, they're going to be drinking a cup of poison. And isn't it interesting that right now, Iran is probably the chiefest of all the nations surrounding Jerusalem on the Golan Heights, in Damascus, in Lebanon with Hezbollah, and the Gaza Strip with the Hamas. All really proxy wars of the Iranians. And here's where it gets troublesome because the Russians tend to support Iran. They're supporting Iran with, with weapons. The nations that bless Israel are going to be blessed. The nations that curse Israel are going to be cursed. That's just what the Bible says. So meanwhile, with that threat of Iran, now we're, the United States, sending our carriers over and B-52s and our really talented soldiers, according to Trump, whatever that means, um, we're going to go and say, you can't do that. Well, what's going on there? Well, it says the, the nations that try to do that, they're drinking a cup of trembling. Now, we're going to start talking over and over about that day, the day of the Lord, Zechariah talks about. Look at verse 3. And in that day will I make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. The Bible says that all the nations of the world were going to gather against Jerusalem someday. Is that that far-fetched to imagine today? It's not hard to imagine because that's pretty much what's happening with the exception of the United States. So Brett, that's not all the nations. When's the United States going to turn against Jerusalem? I think it's going to happen. Don't know when. Here's a suggestion, something to think about. Can you imagine what our geopolitics are going to look like after the rapture of the church? It's really the church the American church that actually has a love for Israel. And if you move the church out, suddenly you're going to have people who really are anti-Semitic and pretty much the United States, I think, will jump on board with everybody else. Um, it's, it's really something. That to, to, the Jews don't know what to do with you and me, by the way. Whenever I go to Israel, the Jews are like, why, why do you Christians love us? And we try to explain to them, well, the Bible says this about you know, the Jews and God's got a plan for you guys. And they just kind of look at you blankly and say, thanks. <laughs> Glad you love us. Glad you called Jerusalem our capital. Great, thank you. We'll dance and celebrate that. But why? Um, a few trips ago, I took a bunch of folks to a restaurant near the Shuk restaurant, or the Shuk market in Jerusalem, where all the local Jews go to dinner. And they make this bread that they stick up on the roof of this little oven, this stone oven. And when the bread's done, it just kind of falls off. It's just the best bread you ever did taste. And man, you can just put on that hummus and push all the vegetables aside. and just put... <laughs> It's just so great, man. It's so good. Um, anyway, uh, but this one night, we had this great dinner there in this local restaurant. A bunch of Jews kind of look, what are all these Americans doing here? But when we walked out, these two girls dressed in their IDF soldier uh, military, you know, outfits, and they were holding Tavor rifles. And, you know, it's kind of weird having these 23-year-old girls with rifles saying, can we talk to you? We're like, sure. <laughs> Just... And these girls, those of you that were there with me, it was a tear-jerking moment because the girls, tears started coming down their cheeks. And so they, she said, 
I don't know why you Americans love us so much, but do you know that when you guys come here, where your friends think you're crazy to go to Israel and visit us, but we know that for some reason you guys love us, and that's why we're here, you're here. And, and they said, we just want to thank you for being here. And they're speaking in he, kind of a broken Hebrew, a tiny bit of English. And our group is suddenly all weeping on the street there as we're, you know, it's blowing snot and everything. It was, it was a touching moment uh, there in Jerusalem. And, 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 but, but you can almost tell these girls, why do you guys love us? And, and we want to tell them because God loves you. God loves you and has a plan for you and for this city. And it's a powerful thing that the Bible says. But the Jews largely don't have any idea about that stuff. So when the rapture of the church happens, maybe that's when the whole world goes nuts and turns all their guns against Jerusalem, which goes in line with Zechariah 12. Let's read on. It says, in, uh, after being gathered against Jerusalem, look at verse 4. In that day, that's the day of the Lord. What's the day of the Lord? It's when God intervenes in the world very tangibly, because um, he's intervening now to a degree. But when Christ comes, he's coming as a conquering king with 10,000s of his saints, and he's going to intervene. And that's called the day of the Lord, when God says, that's it. And so that's what's talked about here. In that day, verse 4, saith the Lord, I will smite every horse with astonishment and its rider with madness. Look at verse 6. In that day, I will make the governors of Judah like an hearth of fire among the wood. In other words, the rest of the world is the wood, but the Jewish army is going to be the hearth that doesn't burn. Uh, verse 8. In that day shall the Lord defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and he that is feeble among them, the weakest of Jews is the idea there, at that day shall he be as David. And the house of David shall be as God, as the angel of the Lord before them. In other words, when David, the little boy, killed Goliath, that's the way the Jews are going to be when the nations fight against Jerusalem. Also, verse 9, and it'll come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy, this is the Lord speaking, all the nations that come against Jerusalem. Verse 11, in that day shall there be a great mourning in Jerusalem as the morning of Hedad Rimon in the valley of Megiddo. What are we talking about, the valley of Megiddo? Does that sound familiar? Megiddo is the valley there in the Jezreel Valley that's also called Armageddon, or the valley of Armageddon. That's where the last battle, where all the nations led by this coming world leader, Antichrist, that's going to put their guns against Jerusalem and against Israel. And that's where Revelation 19 says that Christ returns with 10,000s of his saints with on his thigh is written King of Kings, Lord of Lords. Christ is going to come. See, what we learn here in this passage of Zechariah 12 is kind of interesting. There's several things. First, uh, we learn that all the nations that try to deal with Jerusalem are going to have a big problem on their hands. Verses 1 and 2 and 3. Also, the nations that oppose Jerusalem will be destroyed by God. Chapter 12, verse 9. We also learn that Jesus will personally come and fight these nations. What? You just said that, but we didn't see that. Turn to chapter 14. Just turn the page. Zechariah 14. This is where it gets pretty heavy. Uh, remember when I told you that our previous president wanted to divide Jerusalem in half? 67 borders? Check this out. Verse 1 of chapter 14. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh... And thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee, for I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. And the city shall be taken, the houses rifled, the women ravished. Half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then, verse 3, shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. And his feet shall stand that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. Um, then it talks about the Mount of Olives splitting and water coming in, and then the Jews fleeing to Azal, which is an old name for Petra. It's all part of the end time scenario. Um, and then, but look at verse nine. And the Lord shall be the, uh, be king over all the earth. In that day there shall be one Lord, and His name one. Verse eleven. And men shall dwell in it, and there shall be no more utter destruction. But Jerusalem shall be safely inhabited. And it can go on and on about what the Lord's going to do uh, in the day of the Lord. You see, what I see here is the Bible says simply it's going to go like this. Right now, the nations that bless Israel are going to be blessed. The nations that curse Israel are going to be cursed. It's that simple. We're being blessed right now because we're blessing Israel. That's just the bottom line. 
But the day that the United States turns against Israel, pretty much the rest of the nations of the world will follow that. that. And I believe that could mean, really, that the Lord's return is very soon. We could be living in the last days. It doesn't need, really, to switch that much to make all that kick into gear work where all the nations turn against Jerusalem. That's not hard to even imagine right now because most of the nations already hate Israel for no reason, but they hate Israel. So not that big of a stretch of the imagination. Why? Because I think we're living close to those times. But Brett, you're happy. This is scary. I'm happy because the Lord's plan is a perfect plan. And by the way, I don't think we're going to be stuck in this. You, you all see it as doom and gloom. I see it as boom and zoom. <laughs> what? Huh? Well, see, I believe before the wrath of God is poured out upon this Christ-rejecting sinful world, what's going to happen, the Bible says that, it says that we are going to be caught up, First Thessalonians chapter 4, to be with him in the sky. That's not the coming of the Lord. That's called the rapture of the church. I believe we're going to be taken up out before that all goes down. Then the Lord pours out his wrath upon this Christ-rejecting sinful world. There's a seven-year period where a lot of the stuff we're reading about is going to happen, including all the nations turning against the Jews in Israel. I believe that's going to happen at the end of the seven years, or the last three and a half years of the tribulation period. The Bible's clear on this. And the Antichrist is going to make war against the Jews and against the saints of the, of the tribulation time. Well, Brett, aren't we the saints? We are, but we're going to be taken up to heaven. There's going to be saints living during the tribulation, those that were saved during that time, including all of Israel. The Jews will be saved during the tribulation. That's what the Bible says. Now, this is where it's kind of interesting because some of you are like, okay, Brett, got it. So Jerusalem's kind of a big deal. God's got a plan. He's going to rule and reign, be a king there. Um, it's good to support Israel. Okay, What's that have to do with me? Well, here's the thing that's amazing to me. Did you know most of the church in America could care less about Jerusalem? Not only do we not listen to the verse that's here in our text, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Nobody cares. The whole Catholic church, why don't they care about this? Why, why, if you're a Catholic, why were you raised in the church never hearing any of this stuff? I'll tell you why. Because the Catholics have a belief where the church, the Catholic church, replaced the Jews as God's chosen people. The Jews are no longer God's chosen people. They're the ones that crucified Jesus, so they got axed. And the Catholic Church now is, is God's chosen people. Can I just tell you, that's a bad, bad idea. And let me tell you why. Because God made an everlasting covenant with the Jews. And it's all throughout the Bible. We've done whole studies on the covenant of God to Abraham and the Jews. Even though they were rascals and did horrible things in their history, God still loves them and has a plan for them. And the Bible says, I have an everlasting covenant with the Jews, whether they're good or bad. And not only that, Romans 9, 10, 11 teaches us Gentiles, the Catholics, church for the most part, and us. It says, hey, don't be arrogant Gentiles against the Jews. For the, right now, there's blindness that has happened to the Jews. But it says, you, the Gentile, that's us, we have been grafted into the Jewish tree. That's the language Paul uses. And, and that's an important thing because if you say the Jews have been cut off, what does that mean to you, the grafted in vine? Does anybody remember Donald Duck, the cartoon where he's sawing the branch of the tree and he's standing on the branch and he's sawing, but he's standing on the side that's going to fall, not the side that's attached to the tree. That's what the Catholic Church has done with the Jews. Yeah, the Jews, they've been cut off as we're cutting ourselves off from the tree. Without the tree, the, the grafted in vine dies. That's why the Jews are still God's chosen people. Read your Bibles, folks. Um, but Brett, that's the Holy Catholic Church. Are you saying you know more about the Bible than the Pope? Yes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Whoa, that's going to make the front page of the Oregonian now. The pastor thinks he knows more than the Pope. Um, here's the problem. Here's the problem. Nobody reads their Bibles anymore. The Bible says so much about this, I'm only scratching the surface. And man, this is important, not to be arrogant against the Jews. That's why this verse is so important. Pray, you and I, what are we supposed to do? There's three things, then we'll wrap it up. Number one, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. That's what you're called to do. Your Catholic priests will never tell you, oh yeah, pray for, for the Jews, pray for Jerusalem. Uh, God's got a plan and a purpose for them. You'll never hear that. But the Bible tells us that we, not, we need to really be mindful of the Jewish people and pray for them. And 
Pray for our leaders of our country that, that, are, that right now, whether Trump knows what he's doing or not, I, I can't tell you for sure. But what he is doing, whether he knows what he's doing or not, we're being blessed, I believe, because we are being friendly toward the Jews in Jerusalem. They shall prosper that love thee. I know that Trump has asked a bunch of pastors who I do know, I don't know Trump, but I do know some of these pastors who've been in the Oval Office answering questions to Trump about here's what the Bible says about nations and how they treat the Jews in Jerusalem. And for whatever reason, Donald Trump seems to be listening to that and he's making these decisions about the Golan Heights and about making Jerusalem the capital and all this stuff that I think is largely why we economically are being blessed out of our gourd. So pray for our leadership, because you know what? If we have another leader who kind of takes the opposite, I think we're going to end up going down the, the, the path of so many other nations who find themselves cursed right now, like the Iranians, who are under great sanctions, and their people are hurting, and they've made horrible decisions about the Jews. And because of that, you know, the Persians are some of the smartest people in the world. I always forget what service I said. Did I tell you guys about the time where the Iranians are the ones who, did I tell you guys this, that they're the ones who gave Jerusalem to the Jews. Do you know that? Back, back when, uh, you know, Nehemiah and Ezra and those guys, um, when Artaxerxes, the Persian, who's an Iranian, said, you Jews, go back to Israel, build your temple, build your wall. That was an Iranian who said that. So not only are the Iranians wanting to blow the Jews off the map, but they're the ones who gave them that area to begin with if you really go back in history. Kind of funny. What an irony. But all of that is because of the spiritual battle, and that's what we're doing. When we, you and I are praying for the peace of Jerusalem, what we're really praying for is for Christ to return, for him to rule and reign on the throne in Jerusalem, just like the Bible says it's going to happen. I love what Jeremiah says. If you, if you read up your, your Bible on this, it's kind of cool. Jeremiah 23, verse 5, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David, or the descendants of David, a righteous branch, speaking of Jesus, and the king shall reign and prosper and shall execute judgment and justice in all of the earth. And also, Zechariah 14, what we just read, I'll remind you once again, and the Lord shall be the king over all the earth. In that day there shall be one Lord and his name one. That day is coming. So what do we do? We pray for Christ's return. Lord, come quickly. The early church used to go around saying, Maranatha, which meant, come quickly, Lord, just reminding each other. That's what we want. That's the answer to all of world's problems is for Christ to come, the day of the Lord to come. But there's one other thing, because some of you are saying, bro, so you're saying pray and Jesus is coming and all this destruction and stuff is looming. So what do we do? Do we get guns and bunkers and Cheerios and hide away, quivering in our bunkers until the Lord returns? No. It's funny, there's somehow the narrative of that, that Christians that talk about the end times are all getting bunkers and guns. I think that's ridiculous. What you and I are called to do is to, well, read the little parable in Luke 19 where Jesus told the parable of the king who left and said, I'm gonna return. And he said, occupy until I come. Now the word occupy is, it means to be busy about the king's business. Be busy just doing what you're supposed to do. Live in your life until I come back. And that parable that Jesus told in Luke 19, verses 12 through 21, that little parable tells you and I what we're supposed to do until Christ returns. Be busy about the work of the Lord, sharing the gospel, loving on people, serving one another, loving one another, doing the work of a Christian, not the bunkers and gun thing. Serving, loving, preaching, sharing, doing what we do. That's what we're called to do. And I have found people that believe in the rapture of the church and the end times and start studying that part of the Bible, they're the ones who are saying, let's get busy. Let's be, the time is short. Let's be busy about the work of the Lord. Well, Brett, I just think it's so controversial, all this stuff you're talking about. I just like to talk about other things. You know, we'll talk about salvation and the gospel and helping the poor, but this end time stuff is kind of a waste of time. And my challenge to you that believe that is to say, are you kidding? You're saying that while all this stuff the Bible talks about is unfolding right before our eyes, that we should blow it off, say, yeah, whatever. Even though it's one-fourth of this book, one-fourth of the book that we hold in our hands says, watch, be ready, look, be aware, don't be ignorant about all these things. The Bible warns over and over again about knowing this stuff. And a lot of church, and some of you are saying, eh, I'll just wait and wait it out, see what happens, whatever. 
That's not what the Lord tells you and I to do. We're told to be watchful, studious, studying the scripture, learning these things. God forbid we just kind of say, yeah, Lord, thanks for your Bible, but one fourth of it, we could kind of care less about it. That's what a lot of the church has done with one fourth of the Bible. They've said, forget it. It's all gonna come out anyway. That's not responsible Christian behavior. The scriptures say, study the word of God. Why? Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word. And I'm sad to say there's a lot of ignorant people who haven't really looked at the word and they can care less about how the United States treats Jerusalem, even though it's extremely important. May the Lord give us ears to hear what his spirit says to the church of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, let's pray. And Father, as we take this time to consider this little verse of praying for the peace of Jerusalem, what a loaded topic. Lord, I know it's riddled with controversy and people have strong feelings about various things, but Lord, we know your word is true and it's living and powerful. We know that every word, like, like Paul told young Timothy, that it's given for inspiration and exhortation, for instruction, that every word of your Bible is valuable. Forgive us as a church, Lord, largely the greater church that loves pet topics but avoids the controversial ones. Help us to be a people who love your word, every page of the scripture, and help us to be learning and growing and understanding what your word actually teaches. Lord, of all these things, we are thankful for the gospel. We are thankful that you save sinners like us. And Lord, for some people who hear this sermon today, they might think, yeah, I don't know about all that, but, but knowing that you are God who's gonna come and rule and reign, that can be scary for the unbeliever. The idea of your wrath being poured upon a Christ-rejecting sinful world, Lord, I pray that that would just put that concern, that even fear uh, of, Lord, that, that proposition that you're gonna come and pour out your wrath upon a Christ-rejecting sinful world, that's gonna happen. And, and I pray that, that we'd all be on the right side of that, that we'd be Christ followers and believe and, and accept and be saved. Lord, for we're all sinners, but you gave us the answer for all the world. You loved us so much that you gave your son to die. Lord, we're thankful for that. May every person in this room know that they know that they're saved, forgiven. That, that Lord, should you return, that we'll be on that right, that right page, on the right side of that conflict, Lord. Help us with that. Tap us on the shoulder if need be today that we might be saved. So we go our way now and pray you let your word just penetrate our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Let's stand together. If you're not a Christian or not sure if you're a Christian, man, our pastors would love to pray with you. We won't sign you up for anything, but we'll pray with you. If you don't have a Bible, we'll get you all hooked up. But uh, they're back in the prayer room right over there. So join them, be prayed for, accept Christ, repent of your sins, you'll be, you'll be blessed. Doesn't mean your life will be perfect, it means your life is perfectly forgiven, that's huge. The rest of you, enjoy the, hey, it's a sunny day now, so let's go out and enjoy it. God bless you, see you next time, you're dismissed.